All right. Welcome, everybody, to Pi's February 2023, A Little Slice of Pie. We are testing a different option out this month with a pre-recording for you. So we have a great conversation planned that we are excited for you to listen to. Before we get started, let us start with a very quick prayer. We're getting ready for Lent, so we picked a prayer for Lent to get us started. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lent reminds us to repent, pray, and to do penance. So we begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Through our boldness of prayer, may we grow in gentleness of spirit. By fasting, help us to hunger for your love, Lord. In almsgiving, may we touch the most needy of your people. As we prepare for this Lenten season, help us to keep in mind the needs of all of our students. Grant us the grace to support our entire community in journeying to a deeper awareness of you, our crucified and risen Savior. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we get started with our conversation for today, just a reminder that we have Pi 7 cohort applications open at our website. Any questions can be directed to myself, Abby Giroux, at the email on your screen. And for professional learning questions, our director, Chrissy Von Figlio, is happy to uh, follow up with any questions or inquiries and share more information about Pi and what we do. Today, we are blessed to have a conversation based on the blog that we are sharing for this February. It is called a Lenten Journey for All and is shared by a very good friend of the Program for Inclusive Education, Dr. Mike Boyle. He is a board member for the National Catholic Partnership on Disability and a member of the Inclusion Solutions team. Mike, I'll let you share anything else about yourself and share some highlights from the blog that you wrote for us. Sure. Um, well, well, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be with all of you um, in this time. And um, Lent is um, always a, a great time to be able to come and have a sort of a reflective conversation is what we're hoping it's going to be uh, for today um, to really uh, think about Lent. Um, just again, so so you, know, you all kind of know my background a little bit, just um, so you know where my biases are. Um, I actually started as a school psychologist in uh, the public schools, worked in the public schools, um, through a variety of different kind of paths, ended up leaving um, and going the opposite way and became a principal of a Catholic school. So I've worked in a Catholic school, um, had left that position um, to uh, work at the Greeley Center for Catholic Education, worked there for a number of years. And again, God takes you in many different places. And without my really knowing why, ended up leaving that position and took over as superintendent of the Diocese of Joliet. Um, through COVID. So that was always a very interesting journey. Uh, and then just most recently have become the uh, director of uh, partnerships and content for inclusion solutions, kind of coming back to my original basis, which is again, serving um, people with disabilities, um, serving families with disabilities. And certainly I have a, a passion about um, access um, and about making sure that our Catholic schools um, have the kind of access for, um, for, for Catholic education, because as we know, it's always really a difficult path sometimes um, if you happen to have a disability, um, because Catholic schools aren't always set up to do that. So I, when, I, when I did the blog post, I you know just sort of kind of contemplated and I'm, I'm married to a Catholic school teacher, so I understand sort of the, the challenges of, of working in a Catholic school and not having a lot of time, not having a lot of resources. So I thought, well, maybe I'm just going to um, you know, really focus on just putting some resources in, in, the, in place. Um, fortunate enough to be um, currently the board chair of the, the uh, National Catholic Partnership on Disability, and NCPD has done a lot to really try to support um, practitioners in their um, their role. So a couple of years ago, we actually put together a um, kind of a reflection page for for teachers about um, activities, things that they might want to consider um, from a variety of different ways, as well as trying to pull together a number of other resources. So that's why the blog post has you know resources from Loyola Press, um, as well as um, Oh, gosh, now I just I forgot the other one, but the other one, um, but in, in terms of, of just trying to find some resources, um, just for some quick things for, for classroom teachers to be able to sort of implement um, and to 
to kind of help frame their thoughts around um, uh, around Lent. And um, and it's kind of important, actually, I mean, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to just kind of just jump right in. But I, I think about, you know, when we talk about Catholic schools, sometimes we focus so much on the catechesis part. We work on, on the, the learning part, but sometimes we forget and we kind of push to the side the evangelization place. Um, and really, if we want to think about catechesis and evangelization, it is like it's a it's it's a, a two part organ. Um, so I always think about it as a lung system, because you've got one that's really focusing on the catechesis and the other focusing on the evangelization, which ultimately those two things pulled together really bring your faith into action. And so I guess my challenge to all of you is to think about how can we really focus on our activities around Lent, not just about the you know, the learning about the, the almsgiving, the fasting, the prayer, things like that. But how do we use that as a time to really evangelize? And, and here's the other challenge I'm going to give all of you, because um, Catholic school teachers are always about giving. They're, they're, they, they give, give, give. Um, but sometimes that makes catechesis evangelization kind of unidirectional, one way. It's the teacher giving to the students. And our church documents are really clear that a person with a disability is not just a recipient of catechesis, but it's also an agent. And so use this time during Lent to think about how can I really work on myself um, and allow those opportunities for the grace of God to come to you. Um, and sometimes God places people in your, um, in your path, not so that you could help them, but they could help you. So as you're starting to think about, you know, how do I make my, you know, Lenten journey more accessible for the students that I serve, allow the grace to enter in to make it available for you um, so that you could really kind of, again, build um, yourself and look at it as a challenge, you know, from God. I, you know, I, I think kind of, you know, come back to my um, sort of Jesuit roots because I've worked in a, a Jesuit institution for so long, I guess. Um, you know, I always ask that question, you know, where can I see the face of God and the person that's in front of me? <laughs> so think about this as the opportunity for you to grow and to think about um, those, those, um, those opportunities, again, not just for you to deliver catechesis to all the students that you serve, but allow them to um, be able to, to provide those opportunities for you. So uh, those are just some quick thoughts in terms of, you know, what, I guess what was noodling around in my head as I was sort of developing the blog. Um, I, I, just in the next couple of slides, I just want to, again, it's all about resources. Um, so these, um, these uh, two um, resources that are linked in the blog, so, you know, um, so you do have access there. Um, the, the Teacher's Guide to Inclusive Lenten Activities, that comes from NCPD. Also, there's another... Um, another teacher's resource. And, um, and it's a beautiful thing in terms of, um, it gives you a social story. So if you have a student that really benefits from social stories, um, you know, because that, again, you know, for students that are really um, used to routines, um, Lent, we break a lot of routines, <laughs> which is all good, right? Um, but sometimes for students who are, are kind of um, highly routinized, um, that can be unsettling. So the social story, I think, is a really good way, especially because, you know, Ash Wednesday happens only once a year, right? You only get ashes once a year. And for those kids that really um, like the, the routine, the, 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 the structure of mass, it throws things off. Um, so I think the social story can be really helpful in terms of looking at that. And then just one other kind of other resource um, here, I, I think these are, are just... Um, I, again, just in, in you know full transparency, I I um, on the board at at Loyola Press, and I've always been really happy with the um, the fact that they do have a number of resources um, for students um, and for teachers. Um, these are two: the Adaptive Teacher, um, John Brony and and Charlene Catra, um, is a is a really phenomenal way to look at all sorts of things to do strategies within a Catholic school, and not just a strategy thing. Also, uh, Deacon uh, Larry Sutton. Um, did uh, teach, this is his second book on really on autism in the Catholic setting. So again, it's a very practically based kind of um, resource that could just offer, I think, some 
you know, kind of uh, other paths. And I, I think the beauty about these two works is that they're very focused on what it looks like at a Catholic school without the many different kinds of resources that a public school might have. Um, so it looks at the real reality of Catholic school. So again, just, I, I like to try to pass, <laughs> you know, kind of uh, resources along. So here's, here's something to consider. Oh, I forgot about this one too. <laughs> And again, this is a product from Loyola Press, and Loyola Press has um, a, a series called uh, Finding God, but they have an adaptive version that has a lot of multi-sensory things in there. And if you see, there it is, you know, there's there's um, Lent closer to Jesus. Um, they have about, you know, um, the act of, of, of reconciliation. They have all of these things. Um, they also, by the way, have some other um, sensory prompts. So they have floor decals. Um, so like if you're trying to teach the aspect of the mass and where people stand to receive Eucharist, you know, they've got little floor decals um, and things like that so people can understand paths. But there's a lot of really phenomenal um, sensory inputs that they produce um, to support the adapted Finding God version. So again, just another resource, you know, for you all to, to, to consider. Thank you for all of those resources. I, I've used the adaptive tools with a former student that I had a couple years back um, who was being introduced to just participating in mass with her peers um, as a guide. It was really helpful in some of those initial first experiences to teach her what was going on around her. Thank you. And I actually think that those are really good resources for other kids too. So there's a kind of a universal aspect of it because as we all know, when you're teaching kids, you know, the, the process of, of liturgy, it's, it's kind of hard to um, visualize. And I think just having those visual prompts, again, not only for students with um, disabilities or sensory issues, but I think for a number of different kids. And I think that's always the mark of a good strategy is that if it also benefits other kids too, then, then you're, you're uh, in good stead. Most definitely. Thank you for the reminder at the very beginning there that you shared, Mike, about the teacher and the catechist and the evangelization for myself also as an adult, because I have to be able to live that and have that connection to be able to teach it and share it with my students. That's such a, a great reminder. Thank you. I So I should have introduced at the very beginning, I have Erica Erlbeck sitting with me in my office here from the Pi offices at Notre Dame. We um, have a couple examples and questions, if you don't mind going back and forth with us for a little bit. Sure, absolutely. First one mm. is prompted by the picture of the incense surrounding the um, servers in this picture here. So a couple years back, I had a young man on this spectrum. We were going into an adoration scenario and it didn't occur to me to prep anybody about incense. But I realized as we got into this celebration that most of the students hadn't been around incense in a really long time. Um, and this young man on the autism spectrum started having a reaction, started coughing, wasn't really comfortable with what was going on. But because he started vocalizing his reaction, his peers around him also started like coughing and picking up on incense and expressing their discomfort also. So fortunately, I had a, a priest who was very with it and he directed the server to take the thermal out to try to get the space a little bit clear. We finished the celebration and then had a conversation about what we needed to do next time to prep everybody for what this looked like. Um, and one of those steps included bringing a couple kids in one-on-one -on -one to experience the space, to smell the incense beforehand. Um, so I thought I would share that because it was a huge learning opportunity for me, but just to put out and see if either of you had any other thoughts about the prep work that might go into some of these celebrations that come with Lent. I think what's really important is um, the pre-teaching, right? Um, so, and it's always good. So yeah, it's like, okay, so you, you caught, so next time we're going to do this, we're going to pre-teach this. And it's interesting because I think, um, and again, this, this is for many kids, they get that over sensory kind of reaction to it, um, you know, especially incense, because it's not something that's used on a regular basis. And so you feel that sense of it coming in and you start coughing, right? Because you don't know what else to do with it. So being able to, I think, um, and, and again, I, I'm kind of wondering about, you know, social stories, you know, this might be a good play to, to again, 
<laughs> not just for the person that has autism, but for a lot of kids, you know, here's, you know, here's what it looks like and here's what it feels like. And so when we, you know, when we, you know, um, have incense, you know, here's what it reminds us of and here's why it's important. And, um, you know, under, you know, the old saying, the smells and the bells, you know, of, of the, of the, of the mass, um, and, understanding that it's important that we get these through all of our senses, you know, not just the hearing, but, you know, smelling, seeing, you know, all of that stuff as a way, and again, pre-teaching it, right? And so a word about pre-teaching is, is thinking about, you know, as the teacher really reflecting on the sacraments and, and how we're going to do these things coming up and asking yourself, okay, what are the things that I'm going to need to pre-teach in order to make it really accessible? As with any strategy, you know, it's always about what do I need to do before this happens, before I ever get to encounter some difficulty. So really rethinking, but even more so than how can we make sure as staff, are we taking the time, which is really good time anyway for you, to really sit and think about, okay, coming up, here's what Lent's going to look like. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to think. And then really... Um, you know, asking yourself, okay, well, how can I then start to make this more accessible, pre-teach it? Um, and what are the things that I'm going to pre-teach? Again, it's not ult ultimately for the kid, but it's a great way for you <laughs> as a believer to also to think about how am I going to engage in this Lenten journey? Thank you. Well, and like you shared with the resources from Loyola, a tool that's good for one has a real merit if it's a beneficial for benefit for all. And this was an insight for me that everybody needed that pre-teaching and that reminding, um, not just a couple of kids who had some of those sensory concerns. Well, it's funny too, because I think things that only happen one time a year um, and how beautiful Ash Wednesday is, but sometimes <laughs> we're in the middle of Ash Wednesday and we're like, oh yeah, I forgot about that because I didn't take time to think about it. Um, we're all busy. We're all, it's all crazy, right? Um, but quiet yourself a little bit before Ash Wednesday to really think about that process. And so again, here's that opportunity for you to be catechized um, as, as you're thinking about this and how to really deepen your own um, journey so that you can really fully engage in that process. So take the time to reflect ahead of time, again, not just for problem solving and, um, you know, like oh, I'm going to pre-teach this, but also how is that going to deepen your own journey? I know a personal story for me was uh, my son was in sacramental prep for the Eucharist First Communion, and I was so impressed by the parish staff because they offered to us beforehand, they were walking the students through the process, but for those kids with sensory needs, they offered us some wafers ahead of time to yes. help them to prepare themselves. And for my son, who has some of those sensory concerns, that was a huge step. And we were able to practice. And then when he was there at his first communion, it wasn't about anxiety. It was about being present in that moment. And I was so grateful to that that Stafford taking the time to think of all those barriers um, and to provide that for him. Absolutely. I think um, it's those pre-experiences that help you really to fully engage. Uh, and not just for kids with sensory issues, but I think about kids with anxiety who are very anxious about new situations. Um, and, and you can get so focused like, okay, what am I gonna do? It's, you know, with this thing in my mouth and, and it feels different. And there's so many, you know, kind of those pieces that I get so anxious about, like, am I going to do it right? And um, that it takes away from the actual reception of Jesus. And so those pre-teaching, so you can get those either sensory issues or the anxiety issues, you know, taken care of ahead of time. I think it, it ultimately helps the, the student really fully engage in, 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 the, um, in, in the celebration. All right, thank you. Great conversation so far. This next slide that I pulled up comes from an experience that I don't have a lot of more to add to, but I'd love to hear thoughts from the room. So one of my very first years as a principal, we were getting ready for Lent. Get, the school I was at had this big tradition of doing a live Stations of the Cross. And a mom with a, a student with a really sensitive emotional needs um, approached me about a concern she had about 
the potential for all of the negative emotion and that some of the context that her child might experience. And she wasn't judging, but had some questions about how we were going to support students because it's a rather um, heavy topic to explore, particularly the week of Holy Week leading up to Easter. So I offer this picture of the confessional, which can also be an anxiety ridden space without good experiences and good preparation, but also the beauty of the Stations of the Cross with a reminder that it can impact particularly students with some emotional needs in a way that I hadn't thought of initially. So I wondered if there are any thoughts or comments there. I mean, I think about Holy Week in itself, which is for me a really emotional week when you really immerse yourself in that. So how do we as adults I mean, we can talk again a bit of the catechetical part of that, you know, here, here are the stations, here are the steps, here are the things. Where do we talk about the evangelization part of that? Where's my relationship with Jesus? Where's my relationship with God? And I still get overwhelmed with the idea, you know, of God giving his only son. I'm the father of five. And I think about that sacrifice constantly. And that's that's an overwhelming thing. But how do we as adults verbalize that and say, hey, listen, you know what? When we hear this story, this is really overwhelming. And it really causes me to think. And I wonder. And I feel sad. I feel nervous. I feel, you know, so I think, again, the chance for the adults in the students' lives to be able to verbalize that this isn't like, okay, here's, here's what it is. Boom, boom, boom. Check it off a list. But even today, these things have affective impact um, and that we really should place ourselves in that state of reflection, right? To really, so that we're not just walking through this, but we're really thinking about the sacrifice that was made. And as adults, here's what it feels like. Um, and because affect is such an internal state anyway. Um, and I think that's what's scary to kids because people have all of these feelings, but they're not voiced. So as a kid, I'm having all of these feelings, but nobody else seems to be having these feelings. And so I must be the only one. And the more that we can give, and well, the other piece too, is that kids don't have very sophisticated affective vocabularies. <laughs> so they don't have names for those really strong internal states. So the more that we as adults can label it, share it that, you know what, we have those feelings too, um, it normalizes it, I think, for kids, and I think it helps structure whatever kind of anxiety that people might have. And listen, anxiety is not a bad thing sometimes, especially I think when we think about our relationship, you know, through the Lenten process, um, we should be disturbed, you know, um, and then because it only, I think, heightens our understanding of the sacrifice that was made. But but it's scary. So the more that we can normalize it, the more we can talk about it, I think probably is helpful for kids. Well, and I appreciate in there that you even mentioned giving our students the vocabulary to uh, talk about what I'm feeling and what I'm processing so that <clears throat> with, oh, this I have a word for this and it's not unique to me and it's okay. I like that. Thank you. Sure. All right. I know Erica has a question about considering in schools our connection to the wider parish. Yes. So my question is, during Lent, we often get to celebrate Mass and stations with the broader parish community who might not be aware of some of our individual students' needs. So how can administrators and teachers work with the parish so that everyone feels supported and included when we're in this broader community? So one of the things I, I, I've seen done, and I really like, kind of like it, um, are pew cards. Um, and, and it's certainly just in indicating, and I think that, uh, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I can't remember if, I, but I think that there are a set of pew cards that are available um, for low cost through the National Catholic Partnership on Disability. Um, and it's, it's all about like, how do I interact and how do I, um, encounter a person with a disability that may look very different than me um, to help sort of educate um, people in the pews. And they're, they're just the little cards that you stick in the little, you know, kind of uh, pocket, you know, that's oftentimes found in a pew. 
you know, in terms of like when I encounter when I encounter a person with a disability, here's what we do. And it helps me kind of understand. Um, and it's a way to educate. You know, people are used to seeing those little pew cards, you know, in there, um, you know, for a variety of different reasons. So that I think that's one way to do that. Um, and I, I think that's a, a really helpful um, way. And, and I've heard really positive response from pews uh, from churches that have done that. Nice. Thank you very much. All right. I um, offer this last slide and then I think I'm going to pull this so that we can kind of chat and not share the screen. Um, just as a, a wrap up thought that anybody has on Lent, on um, fasting, praying and giving. And I share this because as I reflected on our conversation today, I was reminded as both a former teacher and principal in a Catholic school, we would often do these giving drives and you, we would collect coins and see which classroom or hallway could collect the most. And I was reminded of the aha moment that I had to acknowledge that we ask our students and families to participate, but they always they can't always participate on the same level as the person next to them. And so we had some really important conversations with our colleagues about how do we how do we do these things in a prayerful way without unnecessarily creating competition or stress for anybody within our community? So that was my final reflection. And then we can open up to any other questions or thoughts. Well, it's interesting because almsgiving doesn't have to always be about the finances, right? Um, and it can be about service. And so, you know, if we find um, that we're in a a place where that may be economically challenging for families. Can we open it up to service? You know, are there ways to provide service um, so that it's not about collecting pennies and and then, which is important too. But but um, other ways to be able to give. Um, are there ways to give honestly to our own parish? You know, can we do a day of service? You know, to support our parish um, and what the needs are. Again, is a way of offering that up you know, really, you know, in a, in a you know, a Lenten sacrifice. So, you know, again, sort of maybe broadening the idea of what almsgiving can be and think about it from a service perspective. I had um, one final thought related to the previous question that Erica asked that slipped my mind when I switched slides that I thought I would share um, in the day and age where we live on social media, or there's a lot of activity on social media, a couple of years back, I saw an interesting exchange where some friends moving back into the area posted on Facebook, we're looking for a family-friendly parish, and they were explicitly asking, like, what priest and what parish is going to welcome our kids? We have X number of kids. As much as we try, they, they might be noisy from time to time. So it was an interesting reminder to me because I watched the exchange from people saying, we've been here, they have the pew cards here, our pastor mm -hmm. has spoken out loud and acknowledged that like crying in the pews is an acknowledgement that the community is going to continue for years. So it's mm -hmm. an interesting um, it was an interesting reminder to watch that exchange on social media and to know that families are, are asking and um, supporting each other, finding those right spaces as well. Well, it's interesting too, you know, and, and we're seeing, seeing it sometimes in systems, right? So if you look at the, um, the Diocese of Arlington, Virginia, um, Bishop Burbage has, has made a proclamation, you know, that all their schools are inclusive. Um, I mean, he's very specifically said that. Um, and they've got the kind of um, internal structures within the school's office um, to, to really work towards that. Um, we see some other larger system starting to make the designation that yes, we are welcome to all um, not, and, and recognizing that they're gonna have to build for that. So, you know, um, they're, you know, it would be nice to think we could just open our doors and that we have the capacity to do that. We recognize that we need to build capacity. It's why your program exists, right? You know, so that you can start to build the capacity of schools um, to be able to know the kinds of strategies to do that. But um, listen, it's slow, right? I mean, this, this should have happened a long time ago. Um, you know, I always point out that in 1978, you know, the bishops wrote the pastoral letter on persons with disabilities. 1978, they were calling for inclusive practice in Catholic schools. That was, you know, a long time ago. Um, so we're behind, right? But um, at least we're seeing some recognition. I think that, um, you know, 
yes, we should be, um, you know, our, uh, and then and really trying to build sort of the infrastructures to make sure that we're doing it in, in a, an effective way um, to really reflect the, the best practices that should be in place. Um, it's slow, um, it should be faster. Um, having done this for a while, you know, I wish that we were farther along in the process, but, but we're getting there. So we just have to keep plugging away and keep, you know, sort of making, um, making steps in, in terms of how, again, building capacity so that people can really do this. It's slow, but in good work. Um, <clears throat> I've been inspired in the last couple of years just to see the different pockets around the country that have started really gaining momentum and doing the important work. So thank you for your contribution to that. <laughs> Any other questions or comments, Erica? I don't think so. The only thing I was thinking of when we were talking about the emotional connection that especially during Lent students would feel. Um, I totally agree with the modeling from teachers providing those emotions. I also think that if you know a student that is going to particularly have difficulty, that sitting down with them, um, acknowledging that and maybe coming up with a plan, whether that's a visual cue or some mm -hmm. type of cue that if they need to leave for a minute, to regroup that we have some of those strategies in place so that it's not that, you know, if I feel unequipped to deal with those emotions in the moment, I have no way out, but kind of discuss how we can go about that and then hopefully rejoin the community and the group. That's such an interesting, um, uh, the use of a break card, right? You know, uh, how do I use a break card, you know, and um, and the right ways to use a break card uh, as opposed to the other ways that can be used. But but again, you know, uh, uh, recognizing that, you know, kids will have uh, uh, um, emotional responses, you know, to a lot of different things. Um, we don't know what went on in, you know, kind of in their life, you know, before they walked in the door. Um, there could be lots of things that are going on and and may make it hard to sit in a math lesson. Um, so sometimes, again, just using a break, getting up, walking around, then being able to regroup. Listen, we do that as adults. I mean, that's an adult facilitative strategy. So let's look at the facilitative strategies that work for us. Um, and let's make sure that, you know, um, kids have access to that. Because, you know, if we're making kids sit for six and a half hours um, without the ability to kind of get around and to regroup, I mean, I don't think we could do that, to be honest with you. Um, so let's, let's, again, build the kinds of facilitative strategies that we're allowed um, and build them in a developmentally appropriate ways. And we have to teach people how to use that. But, but I think you're right. That's such a good practice. Um, I think again, really good for all kids. <laughs> you know, it's like, how do we make these really good strategies that work and serve a, a person with a disability and make them accessible for all because um, they're really good strategies. They work. Well, and the, the realization that just a little forethought can help avoid a bigger challenge. I, I was subbing in a school right before Christmas and the students went to confession and one of the teachers knew a young lady who was going to not go to confession that day and she let her found a different space for her, let her sit in the pew, gave her a way to pray and be near friends and no one else really paid any attention to the fact that she was in a different space because she was still in the church with them participating and it it worked really well with just a little bit of forethought. I think it would be interesting to think about, um, you know, and again, I think this is probably a structural strategy is that how can schools come together and have these conversations? Okay, for the kid who's gonna have some difficulty in here, and we know that there's gonna be, you know, several, how can we build sort of a structural response to recognize that their path is gonna be a little bit different um, and that it's a valid path, they can go use that path, um, but we're not calling attention um, to that so that we can allow them access um, in the way that, that they need to. Because again, it's um, we can't use cookie, cookie cutter approaches, right? We've got to be able to differentiate different approaches for kids, um, you know, to again, allow access. So, you know, I, but I think what a really great, <laughs> here's a great Latin reflection, you know, time for staff to do is let's come together and how can we make our this Lenten journey accessible for all? What are the kinds of structural things that we need to do um, that are going to make it, you know, kind of accessible for all kids? But I think it would be um, 
a great conversation in a faculty meeting, right? You know, it's like, let's take time to do that. And let's not have to talk about the length of sock, you know, for the uniform violations. <laughs> let's talk about, here's some really good strategies that we can use um, to really focus on, um, on making Lent accessible for all. Thank you. That is, that is about our half an hour right there. Um, but I'm really excited of the reminder to reflect and to have the conversation as adults, but also for the resources that we've shared here so that teachers and building leaders and even catechists can check out and use as they plan for the season ahead. Absolutely. Thanks for your time, Mike. It was great talking with you. Thank you. Thank you. And a good Lent to everybody. Absolutely. And you as well. Thank you.